Thank you and uh, every, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us all this afternoon for this conversation on the Indo-Pacific. My name is Raji Rajagopalan. I head the Center for Security, Strategy and Technology at the Observer Research Foundation. I'm pleased to be moderating this panel on the Indo-Pacific that has been in a state of churn for some time, but has gotten quite intense over the past couple of years. The past year in particular has been a roller coaster one. It will take us all a really long time to come to grips with the impact of all that has happened, one that has shaken every corner of the world in unimaginable ways. The COVID-19 pandemic, whose ground zero was Wuhan in China, has impacted the entire world. This global pandemic could have been an opportunity for the whole world to come together. But unfortunately, we have had much more a conflictual period with tensions rising. This is particularly the case in the Indo-Pacific. China has been surprisingly aggressive in its behavior towards its smaller neighbors around the South China Sea, against Japan and Taiwan on its east, and India on its west. And as a consequence, we have reactions, including the Quad, as other countries come together. The changing balance of power in Asia and beyond offers India and other Indo-Pacific powers immense opportunities to take a more proactive role in shaping the emerging Asian strategic dynamics. But of course, this is not the only problem that we face in the region that calls for greater cooperation and coordination between all the major countries in the region, including challenges of climate change, HADR, human rights violations, piracy, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, unfortunately today's Asia is bifurcated. There is an economic Asia that is quite integrated, but the security Asia is confrontational in nature. This calls for New Delhi and other major capitals to have a clearer understanding of the kind of Asia we want to see and the kind of role each country wants to play in the region. And of course, there is an alphabet soup of minilateral organizations in the region. Any number of trilaterals, quadrilateral, and other minilaterals are active in the Indo-Pacific with the goal of ensuring a rules-based order. Different stakeholders have highlighted the importance of maintaining rule of law, ensuring an open, free, and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Last month, the Quad leaders held their first summit, which was remarkable. But what do we mean by rules-based order when it comes to ensuring peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific? The Indo-Pacific is predominantly maritime, and how are the maritime rules of engagement and freedom of navigation going to be enforced? To discuss all of these important issues, I have two terrific and important guests who daily grapple with these problems. Admiral Karambir Singh, Chief of Naval Staff, Indian Navy, and Admiral Phil Davidson, Commander of the United States Indo-Pacific Command, two practitioners who will take us through the different challenges and opportunities for both India and the US, but also among the Quad and other major Indo-Pacific powers. We will start the session with brief opening remarks, maybe about five minutes each, and then we move on to Q&A. So let me now first invite Admiral Karambir Singh to deliver his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Raji. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, glad to be part of this panel today. Uh, you know, when you say the, in terms of the topic uh, that today's Indo-Pacific is indeed, I agree, it is indeed in churn. It's a manthan as we call it in Hindi. And uh, yet this Samudra manthan, which is the oceanic churn, in Indian mythology, uh, produced Amrit, or the elixir of life in the end. So I remain positive of what this churn in the Indo-Pacific would bring to the region and to the world at large. Uh, when we look at the Indo-Pacific, and you mentioned that, uh, what stands out is the predominant uh, maritime character. And we know uh, that oceans connect, uh, they don't divide. And therefore, the opportunities for cooperation, to my mind, can outweigh the challenges that we face. We've also noticed that there's a natural desire amongst most nations in the region to cooperate and collaborate, because greater prosperity and stability is important to them. And Indo-Pacific, to my mind, provides tremendous opportunities for issue-based convergences, because convergence, as you know, can lead to cohesion. And for India, uh, really India's outlook was aptly articulated by uh, Honorable External Affairs Minister in his book, The India Way, where he says uh, that India will grow with others, not separately. And this growth, therefore, 
uh, will have a collective and cooperative connotation where convergences will be based on achieving something rather than you know being against someone and that something is uh, like we all know is the free open and inclusive indo pacific when we uh, see the constituents uh, when we say free it means uh, freedom to engage in lawful activities in pursuit of prosperity when we say open it implies open to all nations in the region as also others beyond who have a legitimate stake in the common pursuit of progress and prosperity of the region and when we say inclusive this it means collaborative and cooperative frameworks that welcome everyone to join and work together and this commitment is also guided by our honorable uh, prime minister's vision for the region which is encapsulated in the acronym sagar which literally means ocean in sanskrit and stands for security and growth for all in the region it implies moving ahead together so any nation which seeks to promote a free open and inclusive indo pacific would naturally find partners in the region it's like an open architecture uh, network by working together we can add to the prosperity of uh, constituent nations so that all of us can rise uh, with the rising tide as far as the indian navy is concerned we fully recognize that given the expanse of the indo pacific no one can do it alone therefore that is a big enough incentive to work together and as india has emerged as a more confident nation on the global stage the indian navy is ready to do our bit to contribute to the indo pacific's uh, security and stability when you look at our neighborhood immediate neighborhood we are akin to a neighborhood watch if you will we want to work together to bring greater security in the neighborhood and therefore this idea of uh, collective maritime competence because each one of us each navy here brings something to the table whether it's geographical location whether it's technological prowess whether it is some prowess in some other uh, discipline we can all work together and build something called the collective maritime competence we can learn from each other harness each other's individual capabilities and as for the wider indian ocean is uh, when it's uh, discussed the i think the indian navy's aim is to be the preferred security partner we want to be credible uh, forward leaning in our engagements uh, be first responders in any problem or challenge as we have in the recent uh, pandemic we want to shun uh, transactional natures of uh, engagement and work with the regional navies to build their capacities to secure their interests and also work with like minded navies to build interoperability and trust because we know that trust cannot be surged and as our prime minister once mentioned we must not only build infrastructure we must also build bridges of trust so i'll conclude my opening remarks with an optimistic view that uh, akin to the mythological sagar manthan we can work together extract the many treasures and ultimately the amrit the heavenly nectar from the seas and there exist many avenues for maritime nations in the indo pacific to come together and ensure that the ocean churn should be the benefit should be to the benefit of all thank you thank you admiral singh i think that was a comprehensive uh, but two uh, two terms stand out for me trust and interoperability i'm sure we will come back to that during the q and a uh, but let, let me now hand the floor to admiral davidson over to you uh namaste and aloha and uh thank you very much uh, raji uh and for the invitation to participate in this year's rising a dialogue it's a pleasure to be here even virtually uh with uh, admiral singh and i'm thrilled for the opportunity to speak with all of you i'd also like to thank the observer research foundation and the indian ministry of external affairs for again co-hosting the rising a dialogue we consider rising a to be one of our most important engagement opportunities uh, during the course of each year and because it helps to uh, allow us to further evolve and mature our strategic conversations in the region as well as strengthen ties i should begin by saying our relationship with india remains one of us indo pacific command's uh, highest priorities india is a vital partner in strengthening security and stability in the indo pacific and beyond and a partner with which we share common values not just common interests 
A strong U.S.-India strategic partnership is indispensable for peace, prosperity, and security in the Indo-Pacific. And over the past three years, there has been a significant increase in our bilateral defense ties, including interoperability and coordinated actions between our navies and close cooperation between all of our military services as well. And our growing relationship is also gaining strength through opportunities with other like-minded partners, such as Japan, Australia, and others certainly. The quadrilateral construct between the US, Japan, Australia, and India has gained momentum. In my view, it's a diamond of democracies in the region, uh, geographically, that harnesses the strength of our shared values to promote peace and stability in this region. I'm very encouraged by the discussions that have taken place at the heads of government and at the ministerial levels, uh, as well as by the recent Malabar exercise uh, last autumn. And I believe we should think about the quadrilateral in the broadest possible terms and fully realize its potential to create global economic opportunities, including the diversification of supply chains is just one example and address common interests such as cybersecurity concerns, space, and other emerging technologies in the future. The opportunity, I think, uh, to work together is absolutely now. And um, I think one of the key opportunities um, immediately facing us is the Quad Vaccine Partnership. I think it's incredibly promising with its pledge to manufacture and distribute up to 1 billion doses of safe, accessible, and effective vaccines to combat COVID in the region. Indeed, coming together in this multilateral form sends a very powerful signal in support of the rules-based international order, reflects our common values and mutual trust. As Indo-Pacific nations, regardless of population, land area, economic prosperity or military strength, we all have a voice in shaping the international system. The alternative is a stark contrast to a free and open vision. Because the Communist Party of China promotes a drastically different value system in terms of governance, in terms of trade, in terms of human rights and intellectual property protections amongst others. China's very pernicious approach to the region includes a whole party effort to coerce, corrupt, and co-opt governments, businesses, organizations, and the people of the Indo-Pacific, ultimately. An emboldened Communist Party of China seeks to exploit the current glo global pandemic with increased military aggression throughout the Indo-Pacific. Their aggressive, aggressive actions uh, in, in, are, include the East China Sea, the South China Seas, as well as the Indian Ocean region. And their intent is to undermine international law and norms. This is part of the Communist Party of China's campaign to supplant the established rules-based international order with a new order, one with Chinese characteristics, as they say, and one where Chinese national law would be more important than international law. So in short, the Indo-Pacific region is in a competition between a closed and authoritarian Beijing vision and the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now that said, the competition does not mean conflict. And I think uh, those of us in the international community must be doing everything possible to deter conflict. And a resilient network of like-minded allies and partners this includes our friends in NATO and important um, opportunities to come together, like the exercise La Perouse, which just occurred in the last week. It's fundamental to our ability to deter aggression and ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. Lastly, we, all those interested in a free and open Indo-Pacific, we must also have a strategy to address both the enduring and emerging challenges in the cyber and space domains and the effects of developments in artificial intelligence and robotics, 5G, quantum computing, biotechnology, all these things are going to influence military force readiness, doctrine, indeed the security environment going forward.
So I look forward to the opportunity to um, speak with you today, Raji. It's so good to see Admiral Singh as well. And uh, once again, uh, thank you to the Rizina Dialogue for bringing us together, uh, even virtually this year. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Davidson. I think that was, again, uh, a very, very comprehensive diamond of democracies coming together. You outlined the supply chain issue and so on and so forth. And, of course, the emerging and enduring uh, technology domains and how that interferes with the uh, dynamics in the Indo-Pacific. That's uh, very important. Uh, let me start off with a couple of uh, few questions and then we get around to it. Uh, this is a question I want to pose to both the uh, both of our uh, speakers. Uh, so it, it's a simple question in terms of the identifying the challenges and threat perceptions. What do you see as the most serious challenge uh, serious challenge in the Indo-Pacific regions. Which ones do you think you need to uh, do or respond to uh, in partnership with others? Uh, let me start off with you, Admiral Singh. Uh, what are those challenges that you need to be uh, responding to in partnership with others and what do you think you can manage on your own? Uh, so let me start off with you, sir. I, I don't think uh, we can plow a lonely sort of uh, chart. We have to uh, cooperate because it's a, it's a very large... Uh, um, area or canvas that we are looking at in terms of uh, the challenges that we have that are faced by us. So I would uh, uh, list them into uh, on uh, into traditional security challenges and non-security challenges. I think the first one that uh, which is important is that uh, the uh, existing uh, traditional threats, to my mind, the best way to resolve them is through dialogue. But what is happening in certain places is that there is an increasing trend to resort to non-traditional and asymmetric means such as cyber attacks, terrorism, gray zone, uh, warfare. Uh, this poses uh, a danger which and a ch challenge that we need to confront uh, because this is not the traditional method of resolving issues which should be resolved by uh, ideally through uh, de uh, deliberations and discussions. Uh, the second issue is that uh, because uh, uh, in the past we've been seeing war and peace as binaries, Today, there is a kind of a blurring uh, line uh, between uh, peace and uh, uh, war. Uh, and uh, there's something called the, some uh, countries are resorting to something called the competition continuum to achieve their goals uh, operating below the threshold of uh, conflict. And because of this, uh, there are more flashpoints that are likely. Sometimes when you want to uh, carry out certain actions below the conflict threshold, they may escalate to wider responses. Uh, this is another uh, challenge that we face in the traditional uh, uh, canvas. And also there is this uh, uh, increasing misinterpretation and non-adherence to international norms uh, and rule-based systems. Uh, lack of respect for another nation's sovereignty and international law. So the there is a danger that these global commons that we've been used to uh, will turn into contested seas. This is as far as the traditional uh, challenges that uh, we, uh, I can visualize. As far as non-traditional uh, challenges, uh, one of course is uh, many of the conflicts on which are which originate on land or which are on land have spilled over to the sea in terms of uh, at, a, at a lower uh, deniable kind of actions. And uh, there is of course the rise of the non-state actors as we see in places like Mozambique and uh, uh, which again spills over to the sea. We have economic divides, forced migrations, uh, and of course the standard uh, non-traditional security challenges like the IUU, armed robbery, piracy, drug trafficking. In fact, the, our information fusion center, Indian Ocean region, has monitored nearly 2,000 incidents uh, pertaining to maritime security challenges in the year uh, 2020. So this is how I can sort of club these challenges. Thank you. Admiral Davidson? You're muted. Admiral Davidson, you're on mute. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Raji. Let me take the second question first. Um, I fundamentally believe uh, in all the challenges that, that we face that it is much better to be united uh, with others in the region than uh, divided. I was very encouraged by Admiral Singh's comments because, indeed, the seas are what bind us together, not uh, what uh, keeps us apart in this region. And the strength of um, this very diverse region is in countries actually working together. So, I, you know, I, that addresses the second part. To so the first part, 
you know, I'll go back to my opening statement. You know, I do think China is the greatest strategic threat to the rules-based international order um, uh, and is, uh, in fact, uh, what I believe to be um, a concern really uh, to the whole of the globe. Second, I'm also concerned about Russia's malign influence throughout the region. They regularly play the role of uh, spoiler, um, seeking to undermine uh, regional interests, I think, and uh, imposing additional costs on United States engagements, as well as our allies. Um, and they do so whenever and uh, wherever possible. Third, the nuclear situation um, uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And until uh, Kim Jong-un agrees to complete denuclearization, it will remain our most, uh, I think, immediate threat. And it, it goes far beyond Northeast Asia, in my mind. Uh, their habits of um, you know, cyber theft um, uh, and, and other malign activities in the region, including assassinations, um, is a concern, I think, to everybody across the Indo-Pacific. Um, I absolutely agree with uh, Admiral Singh, you know, violent extremist organizations and other non-state actors also pose threats uh, to a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, as they uh, seek to impose their views, radicalize uh, peoples across the region. Uh, we have an enduring threat in ISIS, for example, ever present, evidenced, um, I think, uh, most recently in the 2019 terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, and actually, most recently, I should say, in the Philippines. And then lastly, uh, the Indo-Pacific remains uh, uh, a disaster-prone region. 75% um, of the globe's volcanoes, 90% of the world's earthquakes occur in the Pacific Bas Basin. The natural disasters uh, spring from the effects of climate change as well is something that we all need to be prepared for and uh, something that we need to be willing to come together on. Um, it's an opportunity for cooperation and uh, shared burdens uh, when uh, nations are affected uh, by natural disasters and um, us working together is uh, an important force multiplier uh, when tragedy strikes. Indeed, the Quad itself, you know, coming together in the wake of the 2004 tsunami uh, is an important example there. Back to you, Russ. Thank you. Uh, no, I want to just uh, stress that a bit uh, to see what are the major challenges in terms of cooperation with the others in the Indo-Pacific, uh, because I think uh, bringing together a number of different major powers uh, and smaller powers, uh, middle-sized powers together, it's going to pose some challenges. So are they in terms of capacity and capability mismatch or uh, different military and organizational culture? Or more significantly, are there different perceptions on the threats that we face? So that's something that I want to see, um, uh, both of you, if you can highlight. But again, I also want to see what are the areas that we are looking in terms of major areas in terms of strengthening collaboration, cooperation among the Indo-Pacific countries, uh, especially among the navies. Uh, what areas do you think uh, need more work to be done in terms of creating an interoperability and uh, our ability to bring in a large number of Indo-Pacific powers together? Uh, Admiral Davidson, let me start off with you this time. Uh, you are muted. Thanks. You are still muted, David um, Admiral. Okay, I think I have it now. Apologies, Raji. Um, I trace the major challenges in the Indo-Pacific back to the PLA's aggressive actions. Admiral Singh mentioned uh, some of the uh, asymmetric activities that are going on. These provocations are occurring throughout the region and they undermine the established rules-based international order. Um, in addition to imposing these actions, the CCP is uh, advancing its strategic aims as much of the region deals with the COVID crisis. Um, we've seen it play out in the South China Sea, uh, where they were pressuring the Malaysian exploration ship, the West Capella, within the Malaysian EEZ. We've seen harassing uh, Japanese fishing vessels and the Senkakus, targeting a Philippine Navy ship with a fire control radar, the activities that have been ongoing at the Whitsun Reef. Um, fortunately, I see um, convergence in the region on these potential threats and um, around the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. So along with the U.S., 
Japan, Australia, New Zealand, India, the UK, France, Canada, ASEAN, they've all put forth similar visions for a free and open Indo-Pacific. I think enhanced network of allies and partners is a critical aspect of um, our own engagement here in the region. Uh, so we seek to expand cooperation, you know, increase partnership, improve interoperability by meeting our allies and partners uh, where they are um, in terms of capability, in terms of capacity, and, and in terms of their uh, primary security challenges. Um, again, I think there's great potential in quadrilateral cooperation. Um, I, I, I anticipate progress and in interoperability uh, and information sharing through both service level and joint exercises like Tiger Triumph and Malabar. Um, we'll continue to advance uh, bilateral and multilateral relationships, uh, for example, with the 5i plus. And again, I'd cite uh, the La Perouse um, exercise recently completed here. Um, we also want to take advantage uh, of the Maritime Security Initiative as a primary tool for building partner capacity um, when it comes to sensing the threats, when it comes to sharing the information amongst each other, contributing to uh, coordinated interagency or multilateral responses. These, I believe, are all uh, important uh, opportunities for all of us. And again, I go back to my opening comments here. Uh, nations large and small can uh, contribute here. And again, if we're working together, um, we'll be far more successful in addressing the threats or at hand. Back to you. Admiral Singh? Um, I think what uh, you had asked was are the, uh, are the major challenges in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, different perceptions of uh, threats faced, etc. Uh, when you talk of different perceptions of threats, uh, you know, whilst uh, individual states might have different perceptions of uh, some threats, but uh, you must realize that most of the threats in the maritime domain are uh, transnational in uh, nature. Uh, you take terror, uh, you take uh, piracy wherein you have a, a ship of one nation belonging to one nation flagged uh, with a flag of convenience with uh, you know crew from many nations carrying cargo from one nation to several others uh, attacked by a, a pirate uh, ship belonging to one nation and pir pirates belonging to another so there is a there is a uh, you know transnational uh, transnational uh, nature to whether it's uh, IUU fishing or drugs, arms trafficking, climate change, and they affect all states really uniformly. So there is a uh, you know increasing realization that no single entity, considering the vastness of the oceans and the uh, challenges, that anyone uh, any nation can do it alone. So therefore, we need to come together. And it uh, like uh, Admiral uh, Davidson mentioned, uh, when uh, we the one of the hinges on which you have, uh, you can have uh, this uh, cooperation is on shared vision. And when we see the articulation of the Indo-Pacific by the US, uh, Germany, France, UK, Netherlands, uh, Jap Japan, ASEAN, etc., there are several areas of convergence and alignment. So I don't think that uh, the different perceptions of threats is, a, is an issue, challenge. The other challenge uh, which you mentioned is, uh, you know, military organization, culture, etc. Uh, I think, uh, we seamen uh, or, uh, are, uh, you know, these uh, these uh, cultural differences are largely mitigated by the very uh, maritime nature of the seas. Uh, we uh, have a great connect, a commonality which is rooted in the relationship with the seas. We operate together, we train together, we meet often at sea. So this is actually a, a, a thing on which we can leverage cooperation. The main challenge that I see in uh, getting uh, cooperation with others, one of the challenges uh, is the large expanse of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, just to, uh, Indian Ocean region is just one part of the Indo-Pacific. And just to give you an illustration, the Indo-Pacific is nearly 20 times the, uh, the area of the landmass of India. So that's the kind of area we're looking at. And uh, you include in that the complexity of the maritime domain, number of uh, uh, actors, um, stakeholders, uh, several activities that are going on and i think here like admiral davidson mentioned the only way answer is to work together and synergize our efforts and in that uh, context i completely agree on the issue of information sharing 
which is uh, key because information leads to awareness awareness leads to understanding and uh, generates a common operating picture between friends and uh, partners in fact uh, i would go one step further uh, that uh, you know once we get it, get uh, more uh, comfortable with each other in the white shipping agreements you must move to uh, to exchanges in vessels of interest and gray shipping etc so that we have a much more comprehensive mda interoperability i agree again agree uh, i think we would again the next step should be interchangeability which has been mentioned by the us cno admiral gilday i would be very happy one day when one of our uh, the constituent different navies could operate their uh, uh, aircraft from from each other's platforms as indeed some of the navies are doing uh, abroad training and sub- subject matter expert exchanges these are very important which build bonds of friendship especially in the future leadership that is one thing we must uh, push uh, very strongly so that we build something called the collective maritime competence to handle uh, common challenges in a common fashion and the ultimate aim i think would be uh, when maritime forces uh, with a common outlook are able to plug and play uh, into any situation which involves or requires Uh, multiple partners thank you thank you uh, let me come to now a very specific threat for instance i think most of us here uh, have been surprised in which uh, at the speed in which china is building its aircraft carriers the size of its carriers uh, all of them are bigger than of course the indian carriers given that we are okay we are surprised maybe you you both are not and i'm sure you have had a much clearer sense of how and where china is heading in this uh, in terms of developing some of these capabilities where do you expect the chinese aircraft carrier program to be going in the next 5 to 10 years uh, do you expect them to focus on the south china sea or you do you expect them to go out into the pacific and in dilution uh, and also do you what do you expect in terms of china to build a uh, create a us model of career battle groups how what do you what, what do you sense uh, make of the chinese uh, developments in this regard admiral davidson uh thank you uh, rajiv very very comprehensive question um you know there's two in uh, commission right now the cb16 and uh, cb17 with uh, cb16 actually um been conducting operations uh in the Philippine Sea and the South China Sea just in the you know over the course of the last week or so um we've seen um CV16 especially you know essentially operating within what we call the first island chain the East China Sea and South China Sea um as well as in um the western part of the Philippine Sea um there are both these car uh, aircraft carriers that are in commission the 16 and 17 um are older um ski jump uh, style aircraft carriers built on the older uh, Kuznetsov uh, design and that uh, ski jump design you know limits the number of aircraft uh and the weight and capability of some of the the uh, aircraft uh, and its ability to move forward now all that said they're building a third aircraft uh, carrier uh with a flat deck and what is uh, likely to be a catapult system with it um you know that gives them the opportunity probably to add aircraft uh take it um uh, farther abroad to be certain um they've been underway just with the C- CB16 you know clearly you know, building some of their skills uh with training they've been underway in a group construct with uh, several ships uh in escort with them i think um uh you know a group construct w- would be the the future design of what they in- intend to do um and as you look at uh, the third carrier coming down the line uh about mid decade um the amount of time it would take to integrate um uh the aircraft you know shake the ship out work on their group concepts you know i would suspect it'll be uh, operational in the latter half of the decade um aircraft carriers um uh can be global capable if you have the requisite uh, support um allies and partners around the globe ought to be something that uh, we're all thinking about the potential for it to be operating in the indian ocean for example i think is real and uh could be happening um in the next several years Thank you. Thank you. Uh Admiral Singh, do you want to have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I think uh, you would ask whether we are surprised, not really surprised uh, because of uh, Chinese navy development. 
they have the wherewithal they have the intent and each nation has its own goals and vision and uh, china is no different and uh, i to my mind i envisage uh, uh, continued focus and the uh, pace uh, uh, focus on and the uh, pace of uh, chinese navy uh, navy's growth in the near future as far as uh, whether they'll uh, uh, move into the indian ocean region we've uh, seen regular chinese naval presence in the indian ocean region for over a decade now and if you realize where the chinese look west Uh, from where they are, uh, their energy, their markets, and resources uh, are uh, located to their west. So it won't be surprising that uh, soon they would be coming into the Indian Ocean region, because there is a saying that flag follows uh, trade. Uh, as far as the composition of their uh, carrier is concerned, uh, uh, the plans are pretty clear. They have got to uh, to accompany their carrier. They have a they have the uh, the fleet support ships they have uh, just uh, commissioned their ren high class uh, destroyers uh, so they have, the the point is very clear that they, their intention is to replicate something of the carrier battle group that the us navy has they have nearly all the components in place but i think the most important thing that they'll have to develop is the competence and capability of their carrier air wing which which uh, takes time us navy has been uh, flying their i mean operating carriers since the world war we finished uh, 60 years uh, but i think uh, the chinese are moving quickly thank you thank you uh, let me have a let me come to a specific question again uh, to admiral davidson uh, things are of course heating up on the taiwan straits what are your current expectations and what would the us do uh, recently the us secretary of state blinken uh, warned china on this on this particular issue so what is likely to be the us response to a potentially a chinese invasion uh, how do you assess the chinese capacity to successfully carry out a cross uh, cross straits invasion and uh, uh, do you think the taiwanese are fully capable what is likely to be the taiwanese response as well thank you admiral davidson uh thank you uh, raji um the united states continues to support the peaceful resolution of uh, cross state issues in a manner scope and pace that's acceptable to both sides of the strait and we do that um in accordance with the us one china policy the taiwan relations act and the three joint communiques and we've got a deep and abiding interest in the uh, peace and stability in and around the taiwan strait and whenever i travel in the region other nations always highlight the importance of peace and stability in the taiwan strait and lend to me their concerns beijing is pushing across the globe uh in my view um outside the military sphere but diplomatically economically within um coercive uh, inducements and things like that and certainly in the information sphere uh to try to diplomatically isolate economically constrain and militarily uh threaten taiwan so i think you know all too well the us provides uh defense articles and uh services um to help enable uh taiwan to maintain a sufficient self defense um and we do so in a manner commensurate with the threat um that the uh, uh beijing actually presents our engagement is designed uh to enable taiwan to uh, uh to delay and deny uh, uh aggression uh when it comes to taiwan and our focus is on 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 improving the interoperability within Taiwan's military improving their training and readiness supporting their military professional development um Taiwan recently committed to strengthening its reserve forces and continues to fund foreign and uh its own indigenous acquisition programs as well as its uh training and readiness so we support Taiwan's efforts and our bilateral engagements there uh to adopt um more realistic training and um exercises that prioritize uh, joint integration and joint interoperations excuse me joint uh, operations um in a decentralized environment back to you okay 
Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, have a slightly broader question to both the speakers. Uh, so, of course, the Malabar exercise happened last year, and after a gap, Australia was part of the naval exercise. Uh, and irrespective of the name, it was Quad in action. So, uh, where do you see the Quad going into the future in terms of firming up its uh, agenda in the coming years? And after the Galvan crisis, there has been a shift in the opinion, especially the elite opinion on China and how India must respond, for instance. So, there have been increasing calls uh, calls on the Quad to take on military form, undertake joint operations. So how do you uh, uh, look uh, see this scenario evolving? Is the Quad ready to uh, do joint military operations? Where are we heading in that sense? Admiral Singh, do you want to start off? Yeah, thank you, uh, Raji. Uh, you know, Quad started as a consultative mechanism. And last year, uh, when we, uh, I was at the Raisina, the foreign minister's level meeting of the quadrilateral security dialogue had just been held. And uh, this year, we hold the Raisina, we have the Quad principles have met. So, Quad is essentially evolving and uh, growing organically. And there are no dearth of issues uh, that Quad can handle. This year, for instance, uh, we've taken on the, uh, getting all our collective uh, capacities to bear to ramp up uh, COVID vaccine manufacture. Capacity building is another area where we can coordinate. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, the military part which you asked, uh, the navies of Australia, US, Japan and India, we already enjoy a high degree of interoperability. Now, our engagements like Malabar uh, predate the Quad. We've uh, had very robust engagements with the US Navy in Malabar. Uh, for instance, uh, we started in 1992. We've uh, exercised with GMSDF uh, bilaterally since 2012 and with Australian Navy uh, since for the last six years. And uh, we've also started exercising together in Malabar from the last year. So I think if an opportunity arises, uh, we have the uh, uh, capability and capacity to come together in a, almost a plug and play mechanism. Thank you. Thank you. Admiral Davidson. Yeah, I, I, um, as I mentioned in my opening comments, I, you know, I think the Quad has uh, tremendous uh, potential. Um, for cooperation, um, you know, far beyond the security sphere. Um, um, the, um, the quad vaccine um, approach here um, in the very near term, I think, is a very powerful mechanism and I think signal to the region um, that um, like-minded democracies can come together and work for the common good um, outside even the construct of the four countries. Then there's a lot of things on our horizon as we think about it, right? Um, 5G, you know, space norms, uh, cyber norms, cyber security needs, um, the opportunity to expand our network uh, to others uh, and enable others to contribute um, in all these aspects, um, not just, again, in the security sphere, uh, but I would say um, to contribute um, to defining the international norms that are necessary um, for our mutual prosperity and um, unleash the economic uh, potential of the region. Um, you know, I, I say it everywhere I go. People ask me why the Indo-Pacific is important in the United States. And, you know, I remind them that uh, during the course of this decade, two thirds of the world's population and two thirds of the global economy will be uh, centered uh, on the Indo-Pacific. And um, the power of, of um, the um, global economy to power our collective prosperity, I think, is really, really important. So it's a, um, um, you know, a great opportunity for us to draw together in, in multiple aspects, diplomatically, militarily, economically. Uh, I think it's a strategic opportunity for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, that uh, with that, I think we are coming to the close of these sessions. We are almost uh, the time is up. But I think uh, the all the issues and challenges that you pointed out and the kind of convergence of interest, security interests and strategic interests that bring the Quad as well as the other Indo-Pacific powers together, um, I think there's a huge potential yet to be realized uh, because the problems that we face in the region are not going away, whether it's in terms of the conventional or the traditional set of challenges uh, in terms of China, uh, the Korean Peninsula and so on and so forth. Uh, but also you are seeing new forms of threats, for instance, the China operating large fishing vessels in the South China Sea, the maritime militia, uh, dozens and hundreds at a time. 
especially currently in the Philippines and how things are heating up there as well. So the number of issues and challenges that bring together as well as there are interests in forging a closer collaboration to bring about a, an open, uh, open, inclusive and Indo-Pacific is very, very clear. Uh, so there's, there's a huge, de a whole lot of things that we can do together. Uh, I, at this moment, uh, would want to thank you both to uh, as our speakers for uh, terrific conversations, uh, extremely rich in terms of the what we can do and the ideas for the future. Um, so thank you and uh, really appreciate uh, be, uh, your time for uh, uh, this Raisinada dialogue. Thank you so much.